Abraham Lincoln is 210 years old today. Many think that arguably the most important thing, uh, uh, the accomplishment of the Lincoln administration was the passage of the Morale Act in 1862. One uh, scholar opined, land-grant institutions have transformed the basic nature of American society. Now, cheerleaders for the Morale Act make two big points. I'll use fingers, I call this West Virginia PowerPoint. Use my fingers. Uh, first, higher education in America before 1862 was non-exceptional and elitist, and the Morrell Act unleashed a flurry of new colleges and universities revolutionizing higher education. Second, the emphasis on research and practical learning at the newly emerging land-grant universities spurred large increases in productivity that led to America becoming the world's preeminent economic power in the 20th century. One scholar has said, quote, the act immediately affected the expansion and structure of higher education and eventually the productivity of the American economy, end of quote. I disagree. It's simply not true. First, American higher education was rapidly growing before the Morrell Act was passed, faster indeed than the growth in the first two generations uh, after the passage of that legislation. The research university that evolved after the Civil War grew out of the German model and had nothing to do with the Morrell Act. With the pioneering schools predominantly being private institutions funded by such entrepreneurs and philanthropists as Johns Hopkins and John D. Rockefeller, who bankrolled the University of Chicago, uh, or Leland Stanford, whose gift started his school in 1891 without a dollar of federal assistance. As to the legislation and an American economic a predominance, it is a fact that the American GDP passed Britain's to become the largest in at least the Western world before more than a handful of students had even graduated from one of the new land-grant institutions. I compiled a list of what I thought, uh, who I thought were the 30th greatest American innovators, inventors, and entrepreneurs of the period uh, between uh, the beginning of American constitutional government and World War I. And of those 30, only three were college graduates, none of uh, from a land-grant school. Two of them were Eli Whitney and Samuel F. B. Morris, who went to Yale, and the third, J.P. Morgan, went to a German university. Both of those universities founded long before Justin Murrell even uh, was born. Now, it's true that some land-grant universities became highly respectable institutions. Yet the value of all the land dispersed under the original 1862 legislation, 30,000 acres in each state, amounted to less than $10 million, less than one half of what Rockefeller gave the University of Chicago over his lifetime, and less than a quarter of 1% of a year's national output in the 1860s. Not a dime of regular annual university support came during the first 25 years after the legislation was passed. Even if we look at groupings of distinguished, mostly public universities today, most of them are not Morale Act inspired. Take the Big Ten Athletic Conference which contains 14 schools, including several prestigious research universities. Of the 14 schools, 10 of them, Indiana, Michigan State, Penn State, Northwestern, Rutgers, and the universities of Iowa, Michigan, Maryland, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, were founded well before the Morrell Act was even passed. Looking at the top 25 universities, according to U.S. News and World Report uh, for 2019, a majority were found before the Morrell Act was passed, and most of the post morrell Act schools had no tie at all to land-grant uh, legislation, including prestigious schools such as Caltech, Chicago, John Hopkins, Stanford, and Vanderbilt. 
Speaking of university rankings, a pioneer attempt to rank America's top 10 universities occurred in 1910, some two decades after even the second Morrell Act. And it's interesting that 10 of the 14 schools were private institutions, or in the case of the University of Michigan, a public school predating the Morrell Act. Morrell Act did not dramatically change the most, mostly private dominance of quality higher education. But didn't the Morrell Act jumpstart the creation of public universities and colleges? Not really. I teach at a university founded 58 years before the Morrell Act uh, uh, occurred. Great schools like the University of Michigan, Virginia, North Carolina were all created decades before the Morrell Act was passed. Interestingly, the last two antebellum decades uh, between 1840 and 1860, saw higher education enrollments rise 240%, considerably more than the 200% in the first two purely post Morrell Act decades between 1870 and 90. Indeed, I see no signs that the Morrell Act stimulated college attendance. I think a decent case can be made that it had a crowding out effect. The existence of new public uh, universities led to a decline in the creation of private colleges. I would add here that in the period before the Morrell Act, so-called public universities generally received little or no regular government support, but had governing boards appointed by state governments. It's, it's interesting, by the way, that the tuition fee at the University of Virginia in 1840, $75, was the same as at Harvard College. I would also note that Harvard's tuition fee uh, was actually slightly lower in 1840 in relation to per capita income in the state of Massachusetts than it is today, uh, in large part because of the perverse consequences of modern day federal student financial assistance programs. College attendance is almost the only thing that has become a greater burden to finance over time, largely because of growing governmental involvement, particularly since uh, 1965. What about the claim that the research inspired by the Morrell Act accelerated American economic growth, pushing us to the top nations economically in the late 19th and 20th centuries? Uh, I uh, once uh, compared the largely pre morale Act of 1840 to 1880 to the post morale period of 1880 to 1920. National output rose faster in the earlier pre morale era, during which Ro Walt Rostow argued America underwent its takeoff. Uh, looking at the total factor of productivity growth, uh, the growth most associated with innovation and entrepreneurship, it was estimated to be greater in the pre morrell era, explaining a majority of per capita output growth in the earlier period, less so later on. Now, moving very quickly, and I'm nearly done, to the modern era, I would further argue that the more modern-day legislation passed in the Morrill Act tradition, such as the Higher Education Act of 1965, has largely failed. In the absence of such aggressive federal and even state government interventions, America still would have uh, uh, had many of the world's top universities, and economic growth would have probably been higher than actually experienced. We took resources from a highly productive private sector, disciplined by markets and competition, and gave them, through a monopolistic political process, to inefficient institutions protected by public subsidies from highly beneficial Schupenterian creative destruction. Arguably, public support has provided more income and lighter workloads for those in the universities, uh, picking up on Todd's earlier comments, a la uh, Henry Manny. Uh, and, but we should view the, the modern support largely as an, uh, modern efforts largely as an extraordinarily costly exercise in academic rent seeking, which is a subject for another day. Thank you.